go with me to two places in the scriptures. First of all, we're going to go to our text uh, that we've been in uh, Sunday evenings now for some time in Philippians. We're in the book of Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 2 tonight. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 15. That's our text. The message tonight, we're in a series on joy, Christian joy, experiencing Christian joy, understanding Christian joy, uh, and realizing what is biblical joy. Christian joy is not circumstantial joy. Oh, my friend, the Philippian church was going through hardships and heartaches and problems, and yet in the midst of that, they were joyful. Christian joy surpasses our circumstances. Uh, Then once you've found Philippians chapter 2 tonight, then go with me to our scripture of the month in the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 29, the 29th Psalm. And verse 11, Psalm 29, 11, I ask you to turn with me in your Bibles. We'll have an overhead slide for you on Wednesday. But a Sunday night crowd, I think we can open the Bible and find it the uh, manual way. Man, the manual, uh, the, um, uh, oh, there's a word for that. Uh, I said it this morning, but I can't, it, it escapes me. But anyway, what was that? The analog edition, thank you so much. Instead of digital, in Psalm 29, 11 is our scripture of the month. I really want you to consider these scriptures. I want you to think about them, meditate upon them, memorize them. But let's read our scripture of the month together. Psalm 29, 11. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Psalm 29, 11. What a wonderful thing, the promise of strength. Oh, how we need strength. I won't repeat what I said this morning, but number two, oh, what a wonderful thing. It has the peace of God that passes all understanding. Oh, my friend, you look around today and you say, oh, my goodness, I do not know how we're going to continue to go on. I do, by the strength of God and the peace of God. Amen. And so Psalm 29, 11, I want to encourage you. Uh, we have a uh, scripture reminder card out on the welcome displays. Grab one of those, take them home, and put them in your Bibles. Now turn back with me to Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 15. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15. Tonight's subject is finding joy in service and sacrifice. Notice what the scriptures say to us in verse 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world notice verse 16 holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain And this is our text, verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For this same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. My friends, what a wonderful truth we're going to look at tonight. Finding joy in sacrifice and service let's ask the lord to help us and guide us in the scriptures heavenly father we thank you so much lord for the wonderful truths of god we thank you lord father that uh in the midst of this craziness lord in the midst of a crooked and perverse time and even a uh, crooked and perverse nation uh, father we have the opportunity to experience real lasting joy joy that is not circumstantial it certainly isn't political but god is based on something far deeper and far more real and far more eternal. Father, I pray as we turn our hearts and our minds and our eyes to you tonight, Lord, that you would teach us from the scriptures in Jesus' name, and amen. Now, just by way of review, we've uh, found a few things as we looked in the book of Philippians. Number one, we noticed that there were 17 references to joy and rejoicing. So if you were to put 17 references together in this short book, you'll find that the book of Philippians has more to say about joy than any other of the New Testament epistles or even any of the books of the Old Testament. There's more content about joy in there. So if you're wondering about or curious about the what it really is joy, the book of Philippians is where we go. Now, we, thus far, we've looked at, number one, uh, joy during problems. Uh, it is very possible and extremely probable if you're saved and you're walking with God, God that you and I can have joy that surpasses our problems even in the midst of circumstantial difficulties we can have joy now happiness is 
circumstantial all right the pulling up to the red light and uh the light turned green i turn happy i get happy amen uh you you you, you need gasoline and thank god for gas buddy how many of you use gas buddy in here all right i always wondered about gas. i was like somebody needs to come up with something I, I can find out what the gas prices are three gas stations ahead well somebody came up with that it's called gas buddy there may be some other things out there uh but when i find out that i need gas and i don't know if this happened to you but you've ever got gas and then you went to the next block and the gas station was 10 cents cheaper oh ah uh but then you find out uh you get on your gas buddy you find out the gas station that you're pulling up to is the cheapest in town you're like i'm happy about that hey, amen there's so many circumstantial things that we can be happy about but happiness is based on our circumstances but joy is based on something far more tangible so we looked at joy and problems number two we looked at joy and prayer we looked at the, the, the joyous relationship that we can have knowing that we're talking to the, the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, the sustainer of the world. There's great joy in having a real prayer life. And thirdly, we looked at joy in preaching Christ. We looked at the truths of the matter of the fact that when Jesus Christ is preached and the truths of the gospel are presented across the world, how we joy because it brings them joy by salvation. We looked at uh, then joy in others. We looked at how God never intended us to be a little, uh, there's, we've always heard the phrase lone wolf. Well, God doesn't uh, have us, that's not God's plan. God doesn't call us a lone sheep. Sheep are in a flock, sheep are in a herd. God intends Christians to be in a church and in a church family where we find strength and comfort and encouragement. That's part of God's plan and part of God's purpose. And we looked at joy in others. Then the last installment of this was two weeks ago. We looked at joy in unity. How God intends for a, uh, not only a family, but brothers and sisters in Christ to be joined together in a care and a compassion and a concern and how there's great joy in having that support. Now tonight we're going to look at joy in sacrifice and service. And I'll give you a little sneak peek. We had two more installments in the book of Philippians as we, as we search through this study of the book of Philippians. Uh, next week we'll look at the joy in the Lord. Uh, rejoicing in the Lord and then look with the last message is going to be in Philippians 4 joy in generosity so I could just kind of whet your appetite there but I want to uh, draw our attention back here tonight to our text now I want you to notice here first of all uh, we started in verse even though our text is in verse 17 uh, we need to back up for context listen let me just make a statement it's not my statement but every text in the Bible has a context God put every verse in the Bible and every subject in the Bible in a place in that greater passage. And great damage is done to the Christian, to doctrine, to truth, when we take a scripture and we lift it out of context. See, that's what the devil did. When the devil came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and the devil was quoting scripture. Listen, the devil can quote scriptures. Uh, false cults can quote scriptures. But what they do is they take a scripture and they lift it out of context. Every text has a context, has a passage. And to really understand that truth, that doctrine, you need to look at the context. And so we'll look at uh, our context for our text. And by the way, a text without a context is a pretext. You know what that is? When somebody has an idea and says, hmm, I want to find some Bible verse to prove what I already believe. And so they go through the Bible and they find a verse and they lift it out of context. That's called a pretext. They're going to the Bible to prove themselves right instead of going to the Bible and to find out what is right. Like Abraham Lincoln said, and I think it's very appropriate for our election cycle that we're in, someone came to uh, President Lincoln and said, Mr. President, uh, do you really believe that God is on your side of this uh, uh, great uh, conflict? And he said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, I don't know who exactly, I don't know if it was a reporter or somebody, said, he said, listen, he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says, the most important thing isn't if his God is on my side or if God is on their side. He said, listen, the most important thing is that I'm on God's side. Amen? He said, the most important thing that I'm concerned about as the president of the United States is make sure that I'm on God's side. I'm aligning myself with the scripture. In fact, I learned something new last night. I was reading, a, I've got a devotional book that I read through called Revival Today. And uh, Mr. Abraham Lincoln, prior to becoming president, heard about D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, one year after being saved, was running a Sunday school class of 650 boys and girls that he personally led to Christ and was bringing in in 18, in the 1800s, eight, 650 people. And L Abraham Lincoln heard about what they called at that point, Crazy Moody. 
And he went to all the way to Chicago to visit Dwight L. Moody to find out what is God doing? And God created a special bond between that revivalist and the future president of the United States of America. I thought that was very interesting. Now, anyway, listen, uh, our context. Let's look back again in our context tonight in verse 15. In verse 15, the, uh, the Apostle Paul, he's enumerating some qualities and characteristics of the mature Christian, and we'll get to why. Notice in verse 15, and uh, he says this, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world by the way and this means uh, absolutely no disrespect to anyone else but God did not call us to isolation God did not call us to be and I won't name any groups but groups that, that just pull themselves so far we'll just say a monastic uh, cloister to pull ourselves uh, uh, so far away from the world that we have absolutely no contact no inter- he said no in the midst of all of this craziness and perverseness and wickedness he says you're right in the middle of that but you're shining as bright lights God has a purpose for us to be in not of the world but in the world reaching the world now look at verse 16 holding forth the word of life now I want you in your mind I want you to count up how many times in verses 16 17 and 18 you read you get your little fingers out or toes out whatever you got to do how many times joy and rejoicing comes up notice holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. How many did you count up there? Did you count five with me? Counted five. Five references. There are 17 total references in Philippians on the subject of joy and rejoicing and in verses 16 17 and 18 we find five succinct very quickly back-to-back references to the phrase joy and rejoicing now when God says something one time it is significant would you say amen to that if God says something even one time in the Bible it's important but when God repeats something a second time a third time a fourth time and a fifth time my friend it's just not important it's significant it is absolutely significant that five times in our text tonight the terms and the phrase and the topic of joy and rejoicing are mentioned and they're mentioned specifically wrapped around this subject sacrifice and service my friend there is something more to being saved than simply coming and sitting in a pew my friends there is a a a, a will of God and there is a purpose of God and there is a plan of God far beyond just getting listen I'll just say this far beyond just getting your fire insurance and saying well thank God I'm on my way to heaven I can do whatever I want my friend that is what the Bible calls license it takes liberty Christian liberty to say yes I am saved no I don't have to worry about losing my salvation it takes it to a degree of fleshliness that turns into license where you say hey I got my fire insurance I can do whatever I want to do and I've met Christians like that and maybe you have too there is my friends a plan and a purpose of God involved in sacrifice and service that brings a joy both present and eternal to the Christian life that the average just sitting Christian will never experience as we look at this tonight, first of all, I, I, I have to notice and I have to note here the, uh, the specific six things, six things the Apostle Paul says. Here's six characteristics of Christianity that he rejoices. Now, would you all agree with me? Would you say this tonight? Yes or no? Was the Apostle Paul a good judge of Christian character? Yes or no? Yes, I believe he was. I believe the Apostle Paul, uh, under the inspiration of God, that what God gave him and, and what God used him in, the Apostle Paul had a good idea if I'll just use this phrase, what was a good Christian? Amen? The Apostle Paul had the place and the authority as an apostle of God to say, listen, if you want to know what is Christianity that's remarkable, Christianity that the Apostle Paul said, now listen, that's the kind of Christianity I get happy about, I get joyful about, I happen to notice this in verses 15 and 16. First of all, they were blamed. It's just very quickly, it's not really uh, germane. It's germane in the fact that it's context. But notice, first of all, they were blameless. You know what that means? It means they were right living. 
to be blameless talks about is a legal uh, declaration. It means that when somebody would bring up an accusation about stealing or lying or cheating, you're blameless. Paul said that's great Christianity, to be blameless. Number two, harmless. Uh, first of all, blameless, that's righteous living. Number two, harmless, uh, that's a peaceful disposition. That's a peaceful disposition. They were harmless. That when folks would look at them and evaluate their life, and by the way, if you look at the context of Philippians, they were persecuted. They were hated. They were this little cult uh, in their minds of this very weird set of believers that had pulled away from uh, the, the uh, gods of the day and the gods of the culture, and they had uh, pulled away from the, the way that people operated. And yet even in the midst of opposition, ridicule and persecution the apostle paul says these are harmless people they were not angry they were not malevolent but they had a peaceful disposition and number three uh that you may be blameless uh harmless number three the sons of god this is a listen a regenerated position a regenerated position. they weren't just religious they were born again there was plenty of religion in Philippi. There was plenty of religion all over the world. The, these folks were the sons of God. They enjoyed a regenerated position. They were truly born again, a part of the family of God, uh, without rebuke. You know what that, well, that, that means? Uh, faultless, or that conveys the thought of a faultless execution. It means that as they endeavored to live their Christian life, people couldn't nitpick them on how they lived and, and so many times in my life I, I have a phrase that I, I, I bring up a lot in my own personal life Tawny knows it I, I, I say this you know what it was well intentioned but poorly executed how many of you ever had a good idea and you tried to do it and it just failed you raise your hand with me I'll raise both hands and just you know you try to do something you know, like I'm gonna get victory in this area I, I'm gonna but these folks they had fault they were without rebuke in their spirit, in their attitude, in their demeanor, in their interaction, the, the, they said they were fought without rebuke. There was nothing that people could say against them. Uh, look at this here, uh, continuing on. Uh, he said, uh, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Number five, they, they enjoyed an illuminating condition. An illuminating condition. You know what that means? It means everywhere they went, they brightened up their world. Hey, they brightened up the corner in the world where they were. Everywhere they went, they were shining brightly for Jesus. They had a good work for the Lord. My, my mind instantly goes back to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said this, that men may see your what? Good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, listen, they, had a, uh, they enjoyed an illuminating condition or an illuminating Christianity that they just shined the love of God and the transforming power of God everywhere they went. Uh, they had an illuminating condition. And they had, look at the last thing in verse 16, holding forth the word of life. You know what that meant? They had a biblical position. So how did they live their life biblically? People asked him a question. Where did they go for an answer? to the bible he said this he said holding forth the word of life my friends you and i ought to have a biblical position when people ask me about my political affiliations i have no problem uh letting them know uh yes i have a political affiliation but you know what guides that my biblical position far greater than a democrat or republican i'm a christian uh, far greater than a uh, whether I'm, I, I belong to this party or that party my friend I belong to the family of God we're informed by the truths of God and the word of God and the Paul said it he said it's remarkable and I'm so joyful that you're holding forth the word of life when they gave an answer it was a biblical answer when they were asked a question they were for a biblical reference my friends I noticed they weren't holding up another book or another author they were holding up the Bible. And Paul said, this is Christianity worth rejoicing about. Now, I want to make this statement here, and I'm going to look at it. Now, let's get into our text. So Paul is having, expressing joy and rejoicing over this type of Christianity. But notice here, specifically in our text, in verse 17, he says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all and then notice number two his exhortation for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me 
Now listen, the uh, Philippian Christian, if you want to take this reference down in Philippians 4, 1, the Apostle Paul considered the Philippian Christians one of his crowning joys. It's one of the crowning achievements of his Christian life. You say, how do you know that? Look at verse, uh, the end of verse 16, he says this. He says that I have not run in vain. That was Paul's personal walk with God. Paul said, listen, I've, poured, I've, I've invested labor into you. He said, I, I've listened to the Lord, and, and I believe the Lord brought me to your town and your city to preach the word of God and to pour my life into you. He, says, I wanna, he said, listen, I, I'm, I'm joyful that I've not run in vain, that my personal life has been spent involved in the will of God. But number two, notice this, neither labored in vain. These were his, this was his ministry involvement, both his personal walk with God and his ministry work for the Lord. And by the way, those are two different things. One of the things that I have to do and Pastor Tim has to do, and one of the things, if you want to pray for Pastor Rob, listen, my work-life balance stinks, all right? I'll just be very transparent here tonight. I need to do a lot better about making sure I'm both a, 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 a man of God that's a, a husband and a pastor of God who watches over a church. Uh, it's very easy for a pastor to get very much out of balance in these things in one way or the other way but the apostle Paul said this he said my joy and rejoicing comes that as I look at your Christian your Christian life listen he says I know that my personal walk with God has been worthwhile number two he says my ministry involvement has not been in vain it's not been empty you see serving the Lord Jesus Christ brings both present joy and eternal rejoicing the uh serving the lord is the apostle paul he says this he says listen the apostle paul said i joy in the sacrifice and service of your faith you know what that means that means serving god brought him present joy my friend, maybe there's an, a missing ingredient in your Christianity. Maybe you're saying, you know, what, what's missing in my Christian life? I know I'm saved. I know I, I love God. I know I'm in the Bible. But what's missing in my Christian life? My friend, it could be the missing ingredient is sacrifice and service. Maybe there's some ministry God has called you to do or some, some area of service God has uh, gifted you to fulfill. But my friend, if you're not fulfilling that, if you're not engaged in that, if you're not involved in that, my friend, you are missing out on the blessings, the joy, the present joy of several things. Number one, purpose. You see, uh, sacrifice and service in the will of God, number one, it brings this, it brings purpose. What is your life all about? What is your life all about? Serving God brings purpose. Number two, not only does it bring present purpose, but it brings lasting fulfillment. Lasting fulfillment. It is not beyond uh, the, uh, it doesn't escape my attention as we turn back to the scriptures. Look here. He says this, um, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain, and say, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice for you all. For this same cause do you also joy and rejoice with me. Uh, my friends, may I just say that the Apostle Paul both had the present, his present fulfillment in mind, but his ultimate standing in mind. My friend, a life served for Jesus Christ brings present purpose and lasting fulfillment, but it also, number three, brings this. It brings eternal rewards eternal rewards the apostle paul was looking beyond this temporal life and he said listen as i look forward into eternity as i look forward to the day of christ i look forward to the rejoicing that my life really meant something can i say will your life mean anything will your life when you are dead and gone is there anything in your life that will outlive you my friends, the uh, sacrifice and service brings present fulfillment and eternal reward. Now, it's interesting, in our, in our text today, God is so good. As we close out uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2, I want you to point out to you that God brings us, and we won't dwell on this tonight, but I just want to point this out, 
two object lessons, one on sacrifice, one on service, that's first, and the other on sacrifice, which is second. Notice with me, Timothy, the uh, young man, the uh, pupil of the Apostle Paul here. If we uh, continue our reading here, starting in verse 19, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 19, uh, the Apostle Paul makes a transition right after our text here. He says this in verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I may also be a good comfort when I know your state. Now look at verse 20. This is the testimony of service that Timothy enjoyed. Uh, In verse 20, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with a father he hath served with me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. And so for verse 19 to verse 24, uh, Paul illuminates or, or mentions Timothy. And Timothy had a testimony of service. It says this, that he naturally cared for their estate. Number two, that he was a faithful young man. Uh, listen, Timothy, we believe as he was uh, called alongside the apostle Paul, was about 17 years old. It's interesting, if you'll take time to trace down the life and the testimony of Timothy. Timothy, as a disciple, was, was well known in his town. Now you remember, let's, let's, let's put the context. So we have a young man, 17 years old. He's not married, not moved out of his house. He, he grew up with his grandmother's faith and his mother's faith. Very little about his father. And listen, not only does the Bible say that he was known in his home church as a 17-year-old man, but the Apostle Paul also lists three other towns. The, the, the furthest town was 75 miles away. We won't take time to delve, delve into this tonight. I'll, leave, I'll just throw that little tidbit out to you, and you can look it up. And I'll let you do that little Bible study. But can you imagine, can I say this, even as a pastor, does anybody know my name? 75 miles away. And this is prior to the internet. This is prior to the radio. This is prior to television. This is prior to the cell phone, prior to the telegraph. Here's a young man isolated, what we would think in complete isolation. And yet as a 17, I'm looking at our young people tonight, a 17-year-old young man, and his testimony was known not only in his church, but in churches spanning 75 miles away. That's a testimony of a young man who served the Lord. Now, secondly, and lastly, if we pick up our reading in verse 25, not only do we see Timothy, a testimony of service, but we see another man, Epaphroditus, and he had a testimony of sacrifice. See, sometimes it's good to see this. Well, what does this mean, Pastor? How do, what does this look like? Look at verse 25. I'm sorry, verse, uh, yeah, um, verse 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, and fellow soldier but your messenger so Epaphroditus was a Christian from Philippi uh, the uh, uh, they had in fact we're going to look in a few weeks at this man Epaphroditus and his responsibility you can see that in chapter 4 but this was a Christian from Philippi and he was also he was with Paul and was serving with Paul but notice in verse 26 for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. This was one of their hometown boys. This was a young man that got saved and came up in their church and they trusted this young man and they sent him all the way off to Rome to go find the apostle Paul to bring a gift to a love offering to him. And while he was en route or while he got there, he became very sick. And word got back to the Christians in Philippi that this young man was very sick. And this was one of their own. This was one of their boys and they were very concerned about him. Look at verse 27. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Remember, the apostle Paul's in jail, he's in prison. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, that I may be the less sorrowful. Look at verse 25. Receive him therefore in the Lord with gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me he was the one carrying the gift and it says this in verse 30 because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death not regarding his life to supply the lack of service towards me Epaphroditus 
had a testimony of sacrifice. This young man was entrusted with a task. And he said, listen, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care if I live or if I die. He says, I'm going to finish my task. He was a young man consumed with the responsibility that was given to him. And he said, if it costs me my life to live and to serve God, then so be it. Timothy had a testimony of service. Epaphroditus had a testimony of sacrifice. The Apostle Paul, and may I say the halls of heaven, rejoice in and through them. So may I ask you tonight, what kind of joy do you have? I mean, not just circumstantial happiness, but real lasting joy. Is there some missing ingredient in your life? And is it, tonight as we go into the invitation, is it that there is, the missing ingredient is either sacrifice or service. Something, some area that God has called you enabled you prompted you and yet for some reason you're not involved in it my friend this could be the reason why you're not experiencing the joy that God would have for you in this part of the Christian life let's go to him in prayer heavenly father we come before you this evening father we thank you lord for just illuminating lord we could say these two words but father you've given us such wonderful truth and examples what does it look like and lord we thank you for that Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us human, fleshly examples, God, to pattern our life after. Father, we live in a generation of me, myself, and I, where our comfort and, Lord, our pleasure is paramount. But, Lord, I thank you, Lord, to show us in the Scriptures, Lord, men and women who sacrificed their life And Lord, those who lived in a life and a lifestyle of service, God, and it brought them a joy unspeakable that was full of glory. Father, I pray that our hearts would yearn for that type of heavenly satisfaction. A satisfaction, Lord, that's not just a a simple sugar high, but God, something that's tangible. And God, something that lasts through all of the trials of life. Lord, I pray tonight we would examine our hearts. God, we would examine our lives. And God, I pray, Lord, that we, like the uh, Lord, like Saul of Tarsus, Lord, as he came to you as a brand new Christian, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, I pray we would ask that question tonight. God, I pray that we would have an open and an honest heart and say, Lord, if there's something that you want me to do, God, I am willing to serve you. And God, if it be your will, I am willing to sacrifice for you, understanding there is great joy. Lord, I pray that you'd help us in this invitation tonight in Jesus' name and amen.